Good afternoon. What a wonderful, wonderful event it has been so far. Thank you for inviting me. As a marketer, one of the things I do is study how consumers make choices. What are the factors that impact their decisions? And most of the time, when you think about it, consumers want to buy these goods and services. And the decisions they face involve making trade-offs among reasonably attractive alternatives, correct? Should I buy strawberry ice cream or chocolate ice cream? Uh, which brand of shoes is really me? Or where should I invest my money? And to me, that's what makes healthcare such a fascinating service sector to study. And here's why. There's two reasons that I would prefer. One, healthcare is a setting where we really don't want to be consumers. Would you agree? We're forced to be consumers. And the second point is that being a patient is just about the least amount of fun you can have as a consumer. As I was putting this together, I thought, maybe having a baby is an exception. But then I look back in retrospect, fun may not be the word we would associate with that process either. Right, moms? So I stand by what I said. Healthcare is a fascinating service sector in which to study consumer behavior for a marketer. Some people wince when they hear me refer to the patient as a consumer. And I think that's because when they hear that word, there are two misgivings, two misperceptions that come to their minds. I can see them think one of two things. A, that if you call a patient a consumer, that she'll walk in, expect it's a fast food restaurant, and expect to have everything her way, right? You can have it your way. Or B, they assume that when we think of the patient as a consumer, the quality of health care that they will get will be determined and should be determined solely by their ability to pay. Neither one is what I intend here. The reason that I use the word consumer to talk about patients is I want to highlight two points to each of you. One, as in any other consumption context, when we come into healthcare as patients, we bring with us not only rational expectations, but emotional needs. We certainly care first and foremost about what treatment we get, but we also care about how we are treated in the process. The second reason I talk about consumers is that you and I are pretty savvy as consumers. We are bombarded by ads every day that promise us the sun and the moon, maybe even a trip to space, right? Everything you can imagine, ladies and gentlemen. And this is true. Think about it. Every hospital you see on a billboard, every smiling doctor featured in an ad wants to convince you and me that we really do come first, that that's the place that will give us the most professional, the most personalized medicine possible. What has been the end impact of this? We, as consumers, have become weary of these words. We've become leery of these ads. And we are saying, nah, I don't know if I quite buy it. You and I have become detectives. We look for clues to whether the rhetoric matches reality. We want to know, does this doctor really put me first? Am I really first in the big scheme of things for this hospital? Now, for over 10 years now, and with a number of different colleagues, I have studied the patient experience. When I say I've studied this, let me give you a, a few ways. A, of course, I've observed a number of interactions of patients and families in all kinds of healthcare settings. I have interviewed every single key player within the healthcare system. And I have even been admitted as a mystery patient. Oh, the things we do for science, right? And drawing upon these experiences, I have put together what I will call the patient's prescription for our doctors and our hospitals. I call it just what the patient ordered. Even though I mentioned doctors and hospitals in this talk, ladies and gentlemen, the principles I'm talking about would apply to any clinical setting. 
and to any player within the healthcare system. Because of the time constraint, I'm just going to talk about a couple of these. So what's on our prescription pad? If you and I as patients could dictate what we expect from our doctors and our hospitals. Number one, I hear from patients, I want you to understand what I am going through. Something may be pretty routine for a doctor, but it can be quite terrifying to the patient and to their family. What we are looking for is not some patronizing pat on the head or some insincere, oh, they're there, right? I feel your pain. That's not what we're looking for. We want to see if the medical establishment understands what we are going through. That when we are faced with a difficult diagnosis, our world turns upside down. We feel vulnerable. We experience a lack of control. And we are detectives, remember? We look around for clues at the hospital to say, do they really understand what I'm going through? Have they tried to put themselves in my shoes? For instance, you know that when you are stressed out and you're trying to navigate a medical maze, you say, is the hospital trying to make it easier for me to at least find my way through the physical space? Forget about solving my medical diagnosis. Can I at least find my way around this place? Does this hospital understand that I need a quiet place to gather, to reflect, to console, to comfort? Or do they make me sit, right? Do they, do they herd us in like cattle or make us sit in uncomfortable rows like captive audience to a movie that we'd rather not see? A second issue that I hear again and again is that we want our healthcare team to see us as individuals. We all know that we don't want to be numbers. We don't want to be some faceless cog in a machine. But even more importantly, we do not want to be reduced to our disease. I remember so well this young woman telling me pretty defiantly as she was going into surgery, she said to me, I am not my tumor. Afterwards, as I waited with her husband and her daughter, the husband said to me, look around. Look around. And I did. I saw nothing wrong. I thought the environment looked great. And then he said to me, look again, Neely. And I did. And then it struck me. A very well-intentioned medical institution, very well-intentioned, had made sure that everything you could see said cancer. There were posters. There were educational materials. They were even inspirational quotes but everything spoke to cancer. And this man, this young man, the father, the husband said to me, this is my wife. She's a mother. She's an artist. She's a swimmer. And they have reduced her to her disease. And he said, why can't I be connected to the rest of the world? My wife knows why she's here. I know why I'm here. And he said, boy, I can't believe it. But I wish there were some you know, some uh, gossip magazines with what's going on with a Hollywood starlet or something that talked about some politician's shenanigans. I'd take anything. And that really made me think about it. That it's very difficult for the healthcare establishment, for our physician, to see us as individuals. Why? Because to look at us as an individual means they have to take the whole messiness of who we are. It's far less scientific than medical treatment. They have to look at us and understand our psychology, our sociology, our economic background, our spirituality. And these are arenas that aren't always so comfortable for a scientific enterprise. Talk to me. Don't talk at me. This is a refrain that I hear from, from uh, patients the world over. You hear patients say this. We don't want our doctors to talk down to us. We want them to engage us in a conversation. Now, in every other sphere as marketers, we get it that there are many different ways in which we process information. Some of us are visual learners. Some are auditory. 
Some are right-brained, some are left-brained. Why can't we bring that understanding to our conversations with our physicians? What we need is an understanding that when we are stressed out, our ability to process information is impacted. Actually, I have a theory, ladies and gentlemen, that when they put on those fancy paper gowns on us, that our IQ drops 30 points, right? It's there's some correlation there that we need to investigate. The best places, the best places I have seen tackle this head on. They encourage the patients to bring a friend with them. They allow you to tape record the conversation. They provide material to you in writing so that you can truly participate, understand what is being shared. Other items that we see. So if I were to write out a prescription for a doctor, a patient told me, I would want them to give me confidence. This was this big, burly man. It was really interesting to talk to him. And he, I said, what do you mean? Tell me more. And he said, I want my doctor to believe in me. I want my doctor to give me confidence that together we are doing everything we possibly can to make me well. He said, I don't want them to sugarcoat things. I'm not asking them to give me false hope. But I want a doctor to look at me and say, you could be one of that 1% who beats the odds. You are going to be in that 5% who survive this challenge. His wife piped in. She said, but wait, confidence is not arrogance. And she started to talk about a physician that she said seemed supremely confident, but pretty sarcastically, the wife called him Dr. God. She would say, God has spoken, because apparently I'm not taking name in vain, but the point there was, she said, this doctor was so arrogant that he could not believe this couple would want to talk to someone else, get a second opinion, ask him to explain himself. And so we're asking a lot out of our physicians. We're asking them to give us a quiet confidence that, in turn, helps us believe in ourselves. Yes, we are pretty demanding, aren't we, as patients? What more do we want to see? RESPCT is not just a song to me, right? It's not just a song. Patients say this again and again, ladies and gentlemen. We really want our doctors to respect us. Lynn, a friend of mine and a patient, put this so well. She said to me, my doctor is an expert. He's an expert on my disease. But he forgets sometimes that I am an expert on me. I have a lot to share. I know myself, and I have a lot to share. And when a patient feels that their concerns are being dismissed, that their input is not valued, that can have a very serious negative effect on that relationship that you build. The interesting point is that many doctors that I know, most doctors, I would say, genuinely do respect the patient's input. The problem is, unintentionally, unknowingly, they send off clues that would make you think they do not respect your input. Think about this. How many of you may have had this experience? You're telling your physician about a condition, about what's going on with you, and they stop you, they interrupt you, because the doctor knows what you're about to say. And that could be true. They know where this story is going. You are the 15th flu shot they've given for the day. right? They may know what's going on. But what happens when you're interrupted? It tells you whatever you have to say cannot possibly that be that important. The doctor already knows. And that can be pretty negative. Another thing I notice is the subtle cues. A young doctor that I saw was really passionate about what she did, but she would stand 
as the patient is talking. I'm not quite going to say she rocked on her feet or drummed the fingers of her hands or looked at her watch, but that's the impression it gave. It looked like I can't wait for you to finish what you're saying because then it'll be my turn. You know how some people don't really listen to you? They're just waiting for their turn to talk. That's how it would feel. Why am I harping on respect so much? I do think that this is the key ingredient. This is that magic ingredient that allows us to get to the ultimate wish list that you and I have, our prescriptions for our healthcare team. Be my partner in healthcare. This is a profound change that we see in consumer behavior in healthcare. What does this mean? This means the very vocabulary of medicine will have to change. We have to stop talking about compliance. What is that? Compliance. As though you and I are peons, and there's a superior dictate, and yes, master, we will comply. It has to be about engagement. We need to be engaged in our own care. We need to be active participants in the health that you and I have. It also means there's a profound change from illness to wellness. And that's what comes with engagement. Now, you might look at what I've said, these six steps that I hear from patients the world over may take different variations. And you might say, hmm, how could that possibly be that important? Isn't what really matters what treatment I get? Does it really matter how I'm treated? I would challenge you that that's a false dichotomy. We know now, ladies and gentlemen, that there's a very strong mind-body connection. We know very well that how I feel will impact how well I heal. So it's actually in our best interest, socially, psychologically, economically, to make the patient a very actively engaged participant in healthcare. What I've said is neither as easy as it may seem to some of you or as difficult as it may seem to some of you. Because what it requires is a true commitment from everybody that they would try to look at the world through the customer's eyes. And I have to tell you the story, Tim. I went to one outstanding medical center, mystery patient, remember? I've done it many, many places, with the permission. When I'm admitted into a hospital, the doctor knows, the charge nurse knows, because I don't want them operating on a leg or something. So, <laughs> but anyway, I walk in. I'm a mystery patient. I go through, meet different people, sign up for blood tests, and everywhere, people pronounced my name perfectly. They would say, Professor Bendapudi, Dr. Bendapudi. That really caught me by surprise. Because guess what? I've been going to the same doctor's office for years now. And if there's a new nurse while I'm waiting, and the nurse comes out with a chart very confidently, then she looks at it, and a look of sheer terror passes over her face, <laughs> I tend to look around. Then I raise my hand and say, that would be me. No worries, that's me. So how is it that in a new place, everybody said my name perfectly? Well, I asked. Inquiring minds want to know. So I asked. They said when I checked in, they put in the phonetic pronunciation. And they taught everybody within the system how to say my name. It's a very small thing. It's a very trivial thing. But it made me think, boy, they really care about me. They really know about me as an individual. They're demonstrating that was an important clue. What I've shared with you, I've said, is a prescription from patients to their doctors. But I would argue, as someone who studies customer experience, that these principles actually transcend any business. Isn't that what you and I want? We want to work with a place where they really try to understand what we are going through. 
They look at us as individuals. They make an effort to communicate with us in a way that we can grasp. They give us confidence that together we can tackle whatever the issue may be. They respect our input and they're glad to partner with us in our own care. I believe that it is. In fact, I'll take it further. If each and every one of us here today, if we would look at the people we serve, not just consumers, but the people in our lives, our loved ones, our business partners, and we said, let me sit down, put myself in that person's shoes, and write down the prescription for me that they would write if they could. Writing a syllabus for a teacher, if you will, from the student's perspective. If we could do that, if we could say, what is it that the other person would expect of me along these six dimensions, and we took the trouble to write it down, I believe that the world would be a better place. And that, ladies and gentlemen, I hope is an idea worth spreading. Thank you so much for inviting me.